to everyone. I was giving access to the audience. Uh, I apologize uh, for this moment. Uh, welcome, George. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm really grateful. We all, we are all really grateful. I am going to introduce uh, this session for a couple of minutes, and then I'll give the floor to, to George. My name is Chris. As you can see, I have brown hair, brown eyes. Uh, I have medium uh, height. Uh, I'm here uh, at my place. Uh, I uh, use a white sheet uh, so that you cannot see uh, everything around in my room. And I'm really excited about this session. This conference takes place uh, within the framework of the master a course on digital accessibility in educational resources uh, of the University of Barcelona. And uh, I am the director together with uh, Cristina Galvan. In the framework of this uh, master course, uh, we offer a series of important conferences uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Siemens is one of the main reference. Uh, I want to thank all the people that are getting connected. I want to thank the Scientific Association for the Evaluation and Measurements of Human Values, the official association of graphic design of Catalonia and Travelport for sponsoring this event. And I want to thank George again. He doesn't need any presentation, but I will read a small introduction. Professor George Siemens researches on networks, analytics, and human and artificial cognition in education. He has spoken in over 35 countries on the influence of technology and media on education, organizations, and society. His work has been featured in local, national, and international newspapers, such as the New York Times, also in radio and television. He has served as main researchers in projects funded by NSF, uh, Intel, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Boeing and the Soros Foundation, and has collaborated on international research works in the European Union, Singapore, Australia, Senegal, Ghana, and the United Kingdom. He has received uh, numerous awards, including honorary doctorates from the University of St. Martin de Porres and the University of Fraser Valley for his pioneering work in learning technology and networks. He holds a honorary professorship at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Siemens is founding president of the Society for Learning Analytics Research. And well, who hasn't read Connectivism, a theory of learning for digital age or knowing knowledge or the handbook of uh, emergent technologies for learning. The, these are other uh, publications of, by George. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning at the Teaching Innovation Unit of the University of South Australia, which is a center focusing on the complex relationship between human and artificial cognition and how the society is transformed how knowledge processes take place and teaching and learning. This was only a short presentation. We are going to give the floor to George and I invite you to write your questions on the chat so that we can give the answer to all of them at the end of the conference. George, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, spend some time with you. Um, I'm going to I'm sure thinking on what I believe school systems need to start paying attention to. And by schools, I mean universities, um, colleges, uh, primary, secondary uh, system, and so on. And what I mean by paying attention to, I'm referring to the importance for us to recognize that the schooling of the future is going to be quite different from the schooling that we might have been used to. Now, we've heard that for probably 20 years or more, but I wanna share uh, what I think is a critical topic or a critical distinction. So the big overarching underpinning of both this presentation and in many ways my career 
is really in a few uh, areas of focus. So one, what I think our big problem is that we have existing systems of education that are structured pre-internet. And that means that it does things, is structured in such a way that it doesn't take advantage of new technologies, new social realities, and so on. The That's the first point. So our systems of learning are not aligned to the second point, which is the opportunity of technologies today. And the opportunities of technologies are collaborative, they're engaging, they're individual driven, um, they give people an opportunity to do things that we perhaps weren't able to do on our own before, such as search new information or find new ways to learn and engage with other people. So that's the core friction. So I'll summarize. <laughs> we have systems of learning from K to 12 to higher education to corporate learning that don't take advantage of the new opportunities of technologies. We've had this statement for 20, 30 years, probably in some cases. Then we have the second aspect, which is technologies that enable new knowledge configurations and new social configurations. If universities don't pay attention to it or don't respond to it, we're going to have a challenge, which we're already seeing emerge, which is that students go outside of schools and universities, many cases more so universities because schooling is required, but they go outside of those systems to get their learning. And that means that we start to see a very fragmented education system. And so that's really the issue. That's the core of what I'm looking at. Systems of learning are mismatched to the needs of society and the opportunities of technology. Technology is now sophisticated, advanced, and enables individuals to have greater control. And because universities in particular aren't responding to those opportunities, we're seeing the emergence of a secondary learning market that is outside of schools or outside of universities. So that's a broad view of you know, my own interest in this area. But today I wanna to talk about one aspect specifically, and that aspect relates to human and artificial cognition. And so what I wanna look at specifically is how do we think with machines and how do we start to change our practices so that we are aligned with the potential that technologies provide in our daily lives as learners. So I'll start by um, covering, you know, really a few broad views of what's happening globally. Then I'll look at just a bit of a definition of AI or artificial intelligence. I'll spend some time talking about what artificial intelligence can do, the shift that it represents, trends in this area, and then I'll finish up by talking about some of the broad challenges that are presented by this. So first, let's look a little bit at what's happening globally. Now, I think all of you are likely aware of it because it's a global trend to recognize, to pay attention to, first of all, what new technologies are doing, but secondly, to how those new technologies are changing um, traditional means of communication. They're changing journalism. They're changing how people uh, have influence in society. Um, there's a lot of activity that happens on social media platforms like TikTok that's outside of the traditional journal ecos uh, or uh, journalism ecosystem. Um, and so there's a lot that's going on, I think, in that regard that we want to try and understand or at least make sense of a bit. And so I said this earlier, but there's a system that's emerging now technologically that is giving us far greater control than it's ever had. Uh, when I was doing undergrad studying, um, I was at University of Manitoba briefly, and I remember being in the library and it would take me hours, days even, to work through the resources to find even a few good articles. Now a student can spend 10 minutes on Google Scholar and find an exceptional quality of resources and materials. Uh, so they can do in minutes what used to take days for many people. The same thing if you want to learn statistics, if you want to learn about biology, if you want to learn a foreign language, if you want to learn culture. There's an incredible amount of resources now available uh, that you can get on your own. And so one of the difficulties, though, 
is because you have these different ways of learning, there's a bit of fragmentation that happens. So one of the things that universities do and school does is it gives students a coherent view of a topic. Now, because it gives them a coherent view of the topic, it means that they understand roughly what at least they have the schemata or the, the structural framework of an expert, even though you might not always understand how the pieces fit, but they have the broad umbrella that an expert has. When you learn a lot on your own, you don't necessarily get that coherence. You have some fragmentary work, meaning that you might have learned a particular statistics concept, but you might not understand what it means in different contexts. So the nuance is often lacking. Um, and that, then this impact of fragmentation of information uh, produces a fragmentation or a lack of coherence with, our, um, you know, with the narratives of coherence that we use to govern as a society. Politically, we see it unfolding in numerous Western uh, traditional democracies where the structure that we were accustomed to for coherent view and trust in institutions, those have all been challenged by networks and they're eroding and there's different voices who are changing the conversation, different voices at the table. And we don't know how to deal with it yet, as well as the rapid increase of misinformation and disinformation and so on. So for educators, it's a big problem. So our problem is that on the one hand, it's really good that students can get access to specific learning when they need it, when they want it. It's a great opportunity to just learn the thing that you need right now. But when people pull these ideas together, the whole point of education is meaningful coherence making. We, as an educated person, we know how society works. We know how biology works. We know how chemistry works. We know uh, things such as commonly accepted views on uh, climate change. And so an educated person understands how these pieces fit and connect. When we learn a lot on our own, we lose some of that fragmentation and we need to really stitch that together, pull that together again. Now, Traditionally, this isn't new because we've had theories of this for a long time, this view that learning is not just in the skull of a person, you know, knowledge is distributed, it rests in social systems, it rests in our connections, it rests in physical objects and artifacts and so on. So we externalize our knowledge, we socialize it. Um, there's a significant ethical and moral implications, how we build our knowledge institutions. Do all members of society have access or are there marginalized members who don't have the opportunity to learn? So there's significant challenges that, that we face in that regard. And I posited a number of years ago that, you know, we're really looking at this as fundamentally network structures, that learning is networked at a biological, at a conceptual and at a social level. And so the view that I had, at least, is that when we learn, you know, knowledge is essentially a networked um, phenomena, a network concept, and that learning is how we grow and prune those networks. And this occurs in multiple levels. It's not just within an individual. The same level of learning happens organizationally, it happens societally, and it ends up be, uh, being ongoing culture. So the problem, and I said this right at the start, it's a systems problem. Our systems of learning and our systems of knowledge are not aligned or reflective of the opportunities that we have. Uh, even though students can learn on their own, they can engage in a lot of different activities, we still teach them and uh, assess them in a similar structured way. And that's a big problem. And that produces a lot of the friction that's enabling um, newcomers out of the field to come in and offer services or provide products for that. Um, earlier this year, there's an annual event out of the U.S. Uh, uh, is it this year still? Yeah, it was this year. <laughs> it's 2021. Uh, 2022, I should say. The ASU uh, GSV Summit is held in San Diego, and it's basically you know the top ed tech and ed tech funders that are uh, changing and restructuring the education system. I would argue it's likely one of the most important annual meetings uh, in the education sector, because that's where a lot of new products, new innovations, new technologies are identified and shared. Universities such as Harvard, for example, are experiencing this unbundling effect, or the, put another way, this, this experience where more and more of the university and more and more of our school system is being provided or addressed by external providers. So it's networked, and these pieces are becoming increasingly networked. Now, in the education sector, we have a need for large scale transformation. And this transformation essentially is this. We want to align our education systems with the affordances of digital, distributed and networked information. And so 
the intent is to say, what does a school system or a university system look like where we have the structure that supports the way that information is being created, generated, and shared today? So that's a key challenge or a key intention. So that's the global trend. So the big global trend I'm trying to articulate is system that is not matched to the knowledge needs of society. Uh, we have technologies that are not being adopted as they ought to be adopted, perhaps in, in school sectors, and that's producing an opportunity for a growing number of external providers to offer services to the education sector. One of the trends, though, that I think in some ways is most significant, and I do a weekly uh, newsletter on this topic, is around artificial intelligence and learning, and I, I've got a link at the last slide. Uh, for that uh, mailing list if anyone's interested. But the artificial intelligence effects in learning are profound and they're profound at a societal level and we haven't paid enough attention to this because the, it's coming quickly, but it's coming in a way that a lot of people feel that it's, ah, it's not a big deal. We'll have, you know, it's not going to have a big impact, but the reality is it's already having a big impact and it's only accelerating. So let's start by looking at AI. What is AI? So basically, it's some component, and there's various ways of defining this. You'll get as many definitions as you want, but essentially, these are computational technologies that are somewhat inspired by or relate to the ways that people in our nervous system, our physical system, uh, works, interacts, learns, reasons, and exists in the world. Um, and in generally uh, speaking, when we're talking about it, it's in three clusters, there's AI, which is sort of the uh, process of making machines intelligent. This sits in two domains generally. Um, the first one we haven't achieved really, which is general intelligence. That's domain transferability across different ways of learning. Uh, and second is narrow intelligence, which is if you've taught uh, an, um, a cancer tissue um, um, machine learning model, you can't suddenly apply it to doing something other than cancer tissue identification. And so it's very much focused on the thing that it's good at. Um, but humans have a high degree of domain transferability. Machine learning uh, is the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And the neural networks or deep learning, which is a big area of focus right now in, in uh, advanced uh, large scale computational systems, uh, such as what you see happening with, uh, you know, with Google, DeepMind, Meta and other platforms. And this models the neural networks that we see with humans. And so there's that kind of, a, of, a, of an impact. Someone may want to take away the individual's uh, mouse that has just shown up here or just suspend uh, their access. Um, so one of the things that uh, that happens um, here, let me just disable annotation for others, sorry. And let me... I'll stop that. So I'm not sure if anyone else has any control on that. So we will leave that here for a second. So I'm just going to go back. So one of the things that we have going on then is, um, is essentially the uh, ability for individuals in a society such as ours to engage in these kinds of complex tasks. And in these kinds of complex tasks, we're seeing growing attention being paid to things like AI and AI technologies. It's expected to be an enormous uh, economic um, activity in terms of having um, significant opportunities for people to um, broadly impact all sectors of society. It's expected to um, uh, have the ability to transform entire sectors that as of this point aren't transformed and um, we'll continue to see more and more of this going forward. I've just sort of locked down the room because there's a few silly people here that we're writing on the screen. So, um, you know, if you have any concerns with it, just let me know. Um, yeah, it's it was just a, a typical spammer. You know, you get a few people who um, have a hard time having a meaningful life on their own. And so then they feel it's important to disrupt what others are doing. And so I've just eliminated the ability for people to share the screen or uh, or other activities. Anyway, so this is the scope of the field, huge, potentially massive. AI is going to have a dramatic effect. And But there's a questions relating how big is it going to be? Will it actually be as significant as people anticipate it will be? And the question is a little up in the air. So there's problems of replications. There's general intelligence. I mentioned general and uh, narrow intelligence. There's uncertainty around how those will emerge over time. And so a lot of those things uh, start to become uh, quite significant challenges going forward. 
Um, the other aspects that arise uh, as a result of this is that we need to look at ways that these things produce sort of fairly significant and fairly dramatic effects, which is, you know, simple things. There's, you know, tremendous potential arising in a number of fronts, and then there are tremendous limitations that arise in, um, you know, technology developing over a long run, which means we have this potential, but we're not really done and we haven't sort of achieved what we need to achieve uh, you know, in, in the long run. Um, and so that's what you're seeing is this, this tremendous, uh, you know, train transition around simple things like where there's potential for a big impact with our current version of AI. And yet by the same account, the technology isn't there. It isn't resolved. It isn't as sophisticated as we were perhaps hoping that it was going to be. And so the next question that arises then is, uh, you know, what happens uh, with AI in this particular landscape and what does it actually do? So AI can do a lot already, you know, artificial intelligence can, you know, how we recognize images, how we speak, there's uh, different uh, factors, you know, that, that can look at scientific literature and scientific data, it can compete in these complex strategy games, it can learn how to drive a car, it can identify tumors, it recognize faces, it can develop recipes, it can create music, uh, if you look at platforms uh, such as um, what we'll see emerging with uh, Dolly 2 and related related systems, there's a deep level of expertise that these systems have already in a number of fronts. And so as a result of that, we have this uh, really complex kind of a setting where systems of AI and related technologies are changing how we are thinking creatively and we're thinking about human uh, knowledge and output. So simple things here is, you know, there's, there's routine tasks and creative tasks and what's the interplay between ethical and uh, non-ethical implications of it. So there's creative tasks that, that can produce, you know, limited ethical dynamics of it, but in certain cases, you could have autonomous vehicles, uh, which is a creative activity, is certainly if it's applied in a wartime or related setting, that could have a significant effect in the long run with enormous ethical implications. So, um, or routine tasks, such as taking care of elderly people with a robot, it's a routine task, but it's a significant potential ethical implication. And so there's others who feel that there's a lot of papers happening where it's, you know, the, the AI landscape is extremely um, rapidly emerging. Uh, there, uh, this is these, this is data, uh, you know, that's recent-ish. There's, you know, 85,000 research papers published, and we have twice as many published. This is in 2000. We have twice as many published just in the U.S. alone now, only 20 years later. So if you look at those numbers, you're dealing with an astonishing array of tools and technologies that are starting to impact how people learn or the access that people have uh, to uh, engaging with artificial or autonomous agents or intelligence. So with that as a background, then globally, we have these changes that I talked about with systemic needs and technology. We have a growing influence of artificial intelligence as a general concept, and artificial intelligence is increasingly encroaching on the creative tasks that, uh, that exist in this landscape. So there's some complex kinds of things going on there. Then we have um, a view that's gone along for quite a while, which is this idea of a Kuhnian framework. And a Kuhnian framework basically means that, um, you know, science goes along normally for long periods of time. And then you have these moments where everything shifts or everything changes. And so as a result of that, you have these dramatic effects that arise where these uh, scientific models and scientific frameworks or in our case, schools and universities and AI, they move along on one model and suddenly everything changes. And that's something that's also reflected by Gould's thinking on punctuated equilibrium, which is that it's not always a slow and steady unfolding. Systemic change isn't always slow and steady. You have things that happen then all of a sudden sometimes, you know, bang, you have these big significant changes and big significant effects. And so that's the argument that I started with, which is that we have systems that are changing at a different pace than our current ones. And as a result of those uneven changes, you are starting to see, uh, you know, fairly significant um, uh, opportunities for other groups that are willing to move faster. So part of my argument here would be that uh, we are seeing 
Uh, the pace of information exceed uh, what we can handle. We're seeing the complexity of the world go well beyond what we can safely handle. And as a result of that complexity, we are beginning to see um, an absolutely overwhelming inability for us to do this on our own. As a result, we need to turn to technology. We need to turn to AI as an active cognitive partner. And so when you apply that in education, we start to say, you know, educators at least have a mindset that says that AI would be instrumental um, in their institutions in the short term, with many thinking it's a game changer and many thinking, many saying that they've started to experiment with AI. So we have a problem with AI, where on the one hand, we have some awareness that's significant, but on the other hand, we haven't made enough changes or transitions rapidly enough to take advantage of that. Currently, there's four primary uses of artificial intelligence in education. Uh, we have the growing effect of profiles and predictions. Uh, we are starting to see a, the use of AI for assessment and evaluation, adaptive systems and personalization, and intelligent tutor systems. So there's a lot going on in those related areas. But I'm interested not in intelligence, but more so in cognition, understanding um, how it is that we engage and interact in systems that are uh, defined where we as humans share cognitive tasks and activities with a machine and what that might look like. So it looks a little like this, where we're saying we're interested in this middle space. We're interested in how does cognition impact where there's a human and artificial element. So as a result of that, we need to start thinking about this in terms of that middle space. That middle space is the one for me that matters the most, where we're saying there's a human agent, there's an artificial agent. And the two of them working together are now producing knowledge. They're now engaging in problem solving together. Now, there's a number of examples of why this works so well. You know, pathologists have a 3.4% error rate. Um, and, and when you combine that, though, with an AI input, the error rate drops significantly. So when, it's this idea that uh, AI coupled with human intelligence, when it's a cognitive level activity, such as you know, cancer detection or something uh, related, uh, it's much better when these two systems or machines work together. So the idea then is that we treat task integration as a shared activity between human and between machine. So um, the uh, other uh, aspect I think that's worth uh, looking at or focusing on at least is uh, we, uh, this concept that came out, this is you know, now 70 years ago, which was around the fits list where we allocate one functional task to a machine and one functional task to a human being. And that's a bit of the angle that's trying to be achieved here. And we've looked at a little bit of things like in nursing, what is human cognition, what is artificial cognition, you know, when someone's driving, when there's creative work that's being involved and so on. Um, how do you integrate or, or uh, acquire uh, the various attributes of these two uh, activities in such a way that you produce a coherent whole? Now, a final set of topics that I'll just share briefly are some of the challenges that arise. And one is that um, almost all technology creates problems that can only be solved by the utilization of additional technology. And so we need to recognize that when we have this rapid growth of one set of tools, we start to see new technology emerge that helps with it. So for example, if we have 200,000 <laughs> 200, papers on AI being published in the US alone annually, no one can read those 200,000 papers. You need to start using systems and mechanisms to assess those papers or to evaluate the quality of the papers or the content of the papers. So these are um, these tools that we use then to make sense of this information are in some cases directly linked or intimate to us. So we're starting to see technologies, uh, not starting, we've seen them for a decade now, that are essentially extensions of our minds and bodies, right, through our phones and our watches and uh, our uh, smart glasses and eventually VR technologies technologies that are starting to have a big impact that way. And that leaves big challenges around how do we ensure that AI isn't used as a mass surveillance system, but instead actually has a meaningful and a quality impact. So we're starting to see regulation challenges emerge in that regard as well. So one of the things that AI does typically is it automates it structures routine and it forces order on things. And so the challenge is what's the future going to look like in terms of our work and in terms of our skills. And a lot of that's around social and emotional learning. Um, it's critical and creative thinking. 
it's this idea of who are we as people that starts to become more important in future skills. So it is the development of processes, not exactly specific knowledge or skill acquisition, partly because the knowledge and skills that are often needed, or at least the knowledge, is better acquired through AI systems than through human beings or human systems. And the final slide then that I'll leave up here is, as I mentioned, uh, you know, an email if you're interested in staying in touch. On, on weekly AI issues. And we have an event next week that's looking at uh, learner profiles and how that might affect various aspects of uh, teaching and learning. So on that note, I've blocked all the videos before. So I'm sorry, just because there were some spammers in here. Uh, so I will um, change that. So I think you should be able to chat and uh, you should be able to ask questions and somebody already locked the meeting. So I think that's good already. So, okay. So on that note, I'm going to stop sharing and sorry for the little confusion there in the middle with people in, in the room. So I'm not sure how you want to do questions or who has access to chat. Hola, bien. La idea es que Hi. nos hagan las preguntas. Muchas gracias. Sorry, yeah. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we made it in the end. So the, the idea here is that people ask some questions on the chat and we'll ask those questions. So right now, we are asking people to write the questions on the chat. So that's perfect. So meanwhile, we are going to deal with the recording. We are very sorry about these spammers. It happened in the most basic classes during the pandemic. I think it was a main, a common issue. So that's perfect. So I'm going to wait for our colleagues to ask some questions. There are over 70, 80 people waiting. So what you were talking about, it's very important for us to reflect on the idea of social media interaction and the point where all researchers, teachers, lecturers are is communication. The learning system is not aligned with the technology opportunities that are offered right now. And there are many obstacles to think technologies might be a benefit for these fields. Uh, so we have the non-aligned system with society. And there are many external protocols to the education system that are offering all the type of training types out of the education system. So I think it makes sense. And that's the way we usually learn. So there are a couple of questions, George. Might be quite broad, but maybe we can get an idea. Is how in artificial intelligence can be implemented within the classroom. Or, this is a very common question, or should the institutions, uh, should the companies provide AI education, not the universities? There's two questions there. Um, one is around um, how it should be implemented in a classroom. So there's AI that we use for teaching. You know, AI helps us teach better, it might give us the ability to give better feedback to students. It might give us the ability to uh, build a profile of a student and so on. So there's ways that AI can make things easier. There's the flip side, uh, which is teaching about AI. And that's development of AI literacies, understanding what AI is, what AI does, how AI works, and so on. And so in that case, there are uh, a number of challenges that arise in both of those. So for AI use in learning, 
there's a lot of opportunities. The four that I mentioned uh, were listed around profile development, assessment, you know, and uh, you know, simple things, practical things like interventions of a student at risk of dropping out or a student that might need additional support just in time. And a lot of, especially at the younger age group, there's a lot of tutoring support that's uh, already starting to um, make a big impact on how quickly students learn and how we help students learn. So that end, that's there. The other aspect, that's there and that's already established, I think in a number of ways that AI can help improve teaching, uh, even though there's ongoing questions around ethics and related challenges that it presents. The flip side uh, that I'd like to look at is that there's uh, a need for AI literacy and a need for people to be comfortable working with and doing things with AI. Uh, meaning, do people understand how to optimally use a technology? What does deep learning mean? What are the ethical and the moral implications of AI technologies in classrooms and so on? So that's a different question. And I think that's a core literacy to your second question of should schools teach it or should universities teach it? And, and I think my view would be that it's something that should be taught uh, by universities. In fact, it's something that should be taught across all sectors of society. I don't think it's necessarily the domain of any particular system or any particular outcome. I really think it's something that should be done across a range of systems. Um, so, and there's like I said, simple things, resources, the email newsletter that I mentioned around regular AI topics. There's a group of events and activities that we uh, do on a reasonably regular basis around uh, how uh, AI should be used or deployed in, in uh, different settings in schools. Uh, one example being learner profiles. There's the second link I'll drop in that is an upcoming webinar on that topic and so on. So to answer your question, I think universities and schools should teach basic AI literacy, but like anything else, we might use a textbook from a textbook company to teach biology in our classroom. Um, it's still, I think, the responsibility of the school systems to teach about AI, but teaching with AI, where we have these tools and technologies being presented to us, that I think uh, requires a lot of ongoing investigation and discussion because we may not always be comfortable with the ethical and related dynamics of AI use in classrooms. Perfecto, muy claro. Um, Thank you very much. That was very clear for me. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions because I think you already answered them before. Sibina says that it would be very interesting if you could talk a little bit more about some examples of AI tools and its links with the information development and how learning based on projects linked with AI should be developed. Sure. I mean, that's that's a great question. There, there are, uh, you know, an incredible amount of AI tools that are, uh, you know, that are now available. So, you know, you can use tools for teaching and learning things like AutoTutor. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, Boxfish has been used. Quizbot is another one, you know, the kinds of tools that are commonly used for, say, learning languages uh, specifically. Now, it's different by different age groups. Um, you know, it's been used for you know, McGraw-Hill and Pearson all have a range of systems, um, you know, there's Squirrel AI that, that will help with their Squirrel AI, uh, you know, out of China that's been done. Uh, there are uh, related examples of, of using mobile learning systems for adapters. Inspire, Newton was one uh, that's around for a while. I think Pearson bought them as well. Uh, Connect, uh, there was uh, a tool Pearson also purchased called Smart Sparrow that was prominent. Um, there's work that's been done around automating assessment and evaluation. And these are tools such as uh, on-task learning, which a colleague Abelardo Pardo developed and, and so on. And so, so the short view is there's a lot of AI systems that are now readily available um, that are beginning to make an impact in classrooms and other kinds of areas and activities. Um, and they're only starting to grow. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, most of the uh, conferences that have an ed tech angle and you look over the last few years, the nature of the conferences and, uh, that are being presented or how they're being introduced, there is a growing level of focus on AI and AI technologies, or at least machine learning technologies as well. 
that'll do everything from creating profiles to directing students, <coughs> guiding students through the course materials and so on. So there's a lot going on in that space. Thank you very much. We need to keep thinking and reflecting we need to think of how this impacts the different levels of learning you usually talk about the overload in the professional areas and in the education areas this is just my reflection i would like to ask you another question so could you give us your opinion about what the learning capability provides AI to the university students, how could these students acquire the basic skills, which would be the basic skills of AI? Well, there's, <clears throat> there's a number of examples available uh, that already exist. Um, which some of them are things like, um, you know, AI is uh, uh, tutorials on the uh, uh, Coursera platform in particular. There's a number of free open courses you can take. There was one of the, um, the countries, uh, Nordic countries recently, a couple of years ago, developed a platform or a set of courses called Elements of AI that were intended to give people that basic introduction or level of understanding on it. I, I think reading books, uh, following you know a few sites, uh, resources and so on that do AI related analysis is a good start as well. Um, and I think the, the, you know, many of the illustrations um, that are already being impactful is, is uh, worth experiencing. So if you look at, Mid Journey, um, Stable Diffusion, uh, Dolly 2, uh, GPT 3, BERT, any of these existing language models. Uh, they, there are many examples and opportunities for people to play with it, even if they're not very technical skill sets themselves. There's a lot of opportunities to experience what it is. And I think when I look at things like AI literacy, it's important to have to have a, at least broadly across society a level of understanding of what does it do. It's kind of the way example I've used sometimes is, you know, when a student we you know if they need to know when should I use Excel as a spreadsheet versus a word processor, and that's just you don't have to know how to write a word processor. You just have to know when would it be a good idea to use this, when would it be a good idea to use that, and so part of what we want to do in this kind of a curriculum development stage, such as I referenced the elements of AI or any of the Coursera courses and a lot of free open online courses that you can access, is to help build that basic level of technical capability so that individuals know what it is, they know what it means, they know how it works, and that's literacy that in many cases now freely and openly available uh, online. So, yeah, that's the case. I have another question that will be the last one. So, there might be some interpretations around this question. So, what's the importance of iconic, sonory filtration of the teacher for, lear for teaching through artificial intelligence? What I think about this question is how important it is uh, visual illiteration, uh, communication means resources to work with AI, with several uh, AI learning resources. Okay, so sorry, could you just clarify? So the specific question again was what? pregunta principal es, es esta. ¿Qué importancia tiene la alfabetización icónico-sonora del so, docente 
This is the main question. How important is the teacher's sound icon literacy for AI teaching? Um, so there's a, I think there's um, a very human uh, means of interacting uh, that does require sort of embodiment or physical engagement and so on. So there's a lot that we can do online. And there's a lot that we can do, say, such as a Zoom call like this that allows interaction with people from around the world and, um, you know, in a way that doesn't have the same cost as physical traveling. Now, unfortunately, I don't get the lovely food from, you know, Barcelona either and the companionship of people, but the general concept is, uh, you know, you're able to travel and see and experience, uh, um, you know, engage with ideas that are not confined biologically or physically to space. Now, the reason I mentioned that is that to the question, if I interpreted the question correctly, the use of AI uh, technologies can be a depersonalizing thing at one level. So for example, it may be that as you're engaging with tools or technologies that you, you know, you're just going through processes, you're jumping through hoops almost is the word we would use to describe it. It's not as rich and as engaging as if you have a complex challenge that's very motivating. The role of a teacher though, so we do know it, so I just want to say that that's an important thing, is that we need to be intentional in our use of different technologies, whether it's educational technologies or something more sophisticated, such as AI and AI related tool sets. The impact of the physical presence, though, is, is, is a valid one to raise, which is we do need to be aware of how people interact with one another in such a way that you have um, a need for us to feel connected. It's not just an intellectual connection online. Um, when, when you meet with people in person, there are cues and dynamics and so on. So one of the statements that, you know, the, our brain exists in a body. It's not just our brain that's intelligent. Our body is intelligent as well. And so if we only have one angle or one point of focus there, we lose a lot of these other aspects. So I think with AI, the human presence and the teacher presence still remains critical. Um, that's why there needs to be this focus, I think, on at least finding ways for these two systems, the human cognition and the artificial cognition to be intersected or inter, uh, engaged in a meaningful way. So I think the idea of human presence might be something critical is very important. And in these regards, if we work on accessibility systems and how important it is to break down those barriers, but sometimes people usually have people with different disabilities, I think this might be something very beneficial and we should find the way on how we can interact in these environments. What you were talking about, right now, we are doing this conference. We are in Australia and there are many people based in Spain or Latin America. And we couldn't do it another way. We try to communicate, not only through this technology, how will we be able to have some means where humans are present and digital accessibility helps more people to take part in different areas such as education, religion, among other things. So there are some issues we need to solve. We need to keep working on this, see how technology evolves and how we adapt technology and how we build from that. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that that kind of engagement and co-evolution, I think, is key. Um, you know, one of the interesting effects is that we, in some ways, store our most complex knowledge in our cultures and, you know, in our values. So, you know, knowledge changes day to day quickly. New research culture changes much more slowly. And so when we're talking about deployment of AI, trust in AI, uh, fairness and privacy and ethical views of AI, we need to be able to make sure that that's a key focus, right? This idea that uh, we, we take care of culture and the, the humane aspects of the process 
And we don't assume that there's only one way forward. Uh, you know, the way forward, I think, in many cases is going to be iterative code development of these technologies. So, for me, we would be finishing the conference. I'm very grateful. I think this talk has grown the knowledge of many people because we could share it with you and all the people taking part in this conference, all the ideas. So we are increasing our knowledge network. I think it is an engagement. We need to inform ourselves about all these questions in all the discipline areas and our daily life areas. So culture change is very slow and we need to keep working according to these different developments so that we can provide to the people's benefit and the people's sake. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much to the organization of AEVA, to the graphic design official school for this opportunity, because it was great for us to have you here. I wish you could come more times. If our master keeps going forward, maybe you could come many times and maybe this could be something more informal and this could be something from our daily lives. So thank you very much. It was very interesting. Well, thank you. And I absolutely enjoy, uh, you know, the uh, many visits I've had to Spain over the years. And I look forward to at some point in the future, those trips returning and uh, best wishes uh, uh, to all of you. So in enjoy uh, the rest of the day and we will talk in the future. So thank you very much to all of you to be here. The recording will be uploaded in our channel so you can share it or you can watch it again. So we are very happy and we are very grateful. We'll see each other in next session whenever it's possible. Uh, good afternoon.